Hello everyone, Brian Weigel here. In this video, we'll, we will be reviewing the book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. As a quick outline, in this book, we'll review the process of normal science, we'll discuss paradigms, anomalies and crises, revolutions, and finally, revolution. During normal science, Scientists perform research that are based upon one or more past scientific achievements. So they supply the foundation for further scientific pursuits. And you all are probably aware of the scientific method, uh, but I'll emphasize that the scientific method should be seen as an ongoing process. Science is constantly renewing uh, and questioning. And so this book um, discusses that deeper process of science that involves the um, scientific method of observations and hypothesis building, the formulation of hypotheses and the questions that are asked, um, developments of theory, uh, collection of facts, and the repeat and re um, refinement of this process to better understand specific questions. Uh, and I'll note that uh, the process also explains um, how it is that science builds upon the work of it, its predecessors. So literally, as a scientist, you are standing on the shoulders of your predecessors who have paved the way before you. So in, the, in this way, um, science improves itself generation after generation. And we end up learning more about um, the natural world. So normal science always uses terms about scientific achievements. You'll often see, especially in press reports, unprecedented discoveries or a breakthrough discovery which changes science or changes the way we see the world. This is by design an attempt to attract adherence to an idea or an explanation um, away from competing ideas or explanations. So adherence of a theory. Um, so these loaded terms like unprecedented discovery um, are by design to gain um, supporters of the claim. Um, they tend to be open-ended and leave all sorts of questions and research problems for practitioners and students to resolve and research. So in almost every grant proposal I've encountered, um, you'll see near the end something to the effect of further research necessary. This is also true of um, nearly all conference presentations where a researcher is presenting initial data or ideas. Um, so many times they end with this further work is needed. Um, nobody received uh, grant funding for work that has been completed and all questions have been answered. So let's talk a bit about normal science, a period of normal science where science as assumes it knows what the world is like. And these assumptions are shared by a group of scientists and that group could be small, or it could be um, larger. If it's normal science, the majority of scientists within the discipline um, will share certain assumptions. Uh, and so assumptions are defended and they are debated intensely because an assumption helps form the foundation or the basis of questions that are being asked. So you're assuming that the facts that you have acquired um, fit into a specific narrative that you are explaining. Um, so novelties disrupt assumptions. If there is a new fact that doesn't match your assumption, then it will cause a disruption. And scientists will struggle to explain that new fact or, or observation, and they will try to suppress it or to uh, negate it, explain it away, um, or bury it in their other facts that do support their assumptions. So obviously all scientists have or bring with them to these explanations 
there and own implicit biases. So implicit bias of every scientist, as much as we try to eliminate bias from our assumptions, it does impact theoretical development. Uh, the process of science is designed to mitigate that issue, but because scientists are human, we all have to be aware as much as we can be of our own implicit biases, how that affects the assumptions that we make. So in normal science, research attempts to force nature into what is already known by the discipline. Um, nature, the, the nature of the natural world in which we live, which most questions, um, scientific questions and research pursuits are aimed at understanding something within the natural world. By forcing them into what is already known, um, cutting edge science or the periphery of knowledge development um, is in some cases standardized, uh, you might say simplified or boiled down. And this allows educators to teach the next generation of students. So think about how science has been taught to you in middle school or in high school versus how it is taught in your undergraduate classes in college and things become very different towards graduate school in universities um, as students become more aware of how the process works. So most scientific textbooks will simplify the known science and focus primarily on facts. That's why there's a lot of vocabulary memorization um, and pro processes and methods that are um, taught. Um, so it's easier to teach science and to learn science um, if you're not uh, trying to teach exactly what we're learning here, theory, paradigms, and how science is structured. So it's not to say that you're being taught bad or, or old science, it's that the facts are being focused on less so than the process. So in normal science, normal science is what is being taught um, to students most of the time. Professional um, scientists have commitments to the assumptions that they have made. Those commitments are very high and entire careers, decades of work uh, and lots of funding, millions of dollars of funding are at stake based on these assumptions that scientists adhere to. So you can see it's very difficult for a scientist to abandon the assumptions that they've based their work on and shift gears to new assumptions. So activities of normal science are often bound within its own perimeters. And we might call this a paradigm. So theories um, are structured within normal science, but theories are explanations of specific questions that we have about the natural world. Well, those questions are framed by the existing paradigms, the overarching paradigm that often form, direct the questions in entire disciplines. So normal science persists. However, there are always anomalies that nag at these paradigms. An anomaly is a fact that doesn't fit into the explanation. It raises more questions and it doesn't offer solutions to those questions. So anomalies are things that cannot be explained by the existing theoretical framework. So uh, eventually um, a shift of basic assumptions becomes necessary in order to explain anomalies. So if anomalies persist, they aren't explained away and more anomalies begin to appear, then the paradigm becomes weakened and shifts are necessary. These shifts are the beginnings of a scientific revolution. So what is a scientific revolution? New assumptions um, have to be created. 
And we know it's difficult uh, for a scientist to accept new assumptions. So it's not an easy or um, straightforward process. Anomalies are incorporated with the reevaluation of previous facts. So if anomalies persist, they cannot be explained, um, scientists may go back to older data or things that were determined to be fact and attempt to reinterpret those um, in a way that will incorporate the new anomalies, new discoveries. So it's a difficult and time-consuming um, process and it's strenuously resisted by normal science. Resisting meaning no funding um, outside the parameters of normal behavior or accepted knowledge, um, these kinds of things. So there are two types or phases, or we could call them stages of science. Normal science would be like the old tale, Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And when Dr. Jekyll drinks his magic potion and becomes the crazy monster, Mr. Hyde, that is revolution. So in this analogy, normal science is Dr. Jekyll, normal scientist going about their business and revolution or the um, instigator, the uh, revolutionary, Mr. Hyde. So scientific revolution, we've seen portrayed in the media, the mad scientist um, pushing the boundaries of normal science. So think of Back to the Future, the mad scientist who designed the time travel machine was pushing the boundaries of what was known um, in, that, in that fictional movie. Scientific revolutions, sci during a revolution, the scientist's world is quantitatively transformed. It's enriched by novelties, of fact, or of theory. Um, you can think of uh, Frankenstein and Dr. Frankenstein who creates a monster, sort of human, by piecing together body parts. A mad scientist whose work pushed the boundaries of medicine, again in this fictional story. Um, media loves to tell the story of the mad genius scientist. Um, sometimes that's an evil character um, and sometimes it's a revolutionary character who is expanding knowledge. The scientist's world is fundamentally transformed during a scientific revolution. It's enriched by novelties of fact or theory. So what good are paradigms? Why does science rely so heavily on a paradigm? A paradigm is something we will talk about over and over again in this series of videos about anthropological theory. So um, we want to really define and understand what a paradigm is. A paradigm gives something for students to study. It packages the facts and theories and methods into um, a framework that can be explained. It helps scientific communities to bind their disciplines together. It creates avenues for inquiry, helps to formulate specific questions. It frames what questions are allowed to be asked. It selects the appropriate methodology to test hypotheses for experiments to be created and it defines specific areas of influence that will influence the inquiry. It helps to establish and create meaning of the world and um, of the facts that we have. Without a paradigm, the same facts would be interpreted differently by different people. Remember our implicit biases. Scientists are humans. We all know in the world today that facts matter, but how people interpret those facts, apply them to their worldview, differ. So how can that be? Humans are all unique. 
we bring our own histories, our own experiences. So we interpret facts very differently. Same is true of scientists. Uh, but paradigms are essential to scientific inquiry. And inquiry or questions helps to form a collection of facts. Hypotheses are built by these inquiries, as well as observation. Facts are collected through the process of observing data collection. So hypotheses can be built. Those hypotheses can be tested and built into theories. So here you see a drawing what appears to be a duck. It's a duck. That could be an effect. That could be a fact. But if you look at those same facts from a different perspective, that duck becomes a rabbit. In a paradigm, as a paradigm grows in strength and gains support, you get more and more adherence to it. Often it's the students that say, hmm, that explanation makes more sense to me. Um, but adherence includes scientists. So within an academic discipline, more and more people will accept one explanation over another in the process of debate. Debate is a very normal part of science. So if a new paradigm emerges, the pre-paradynamic schools of thought, people that adhere to a different explanation, begin to fade away. If you're young and just starting out your career as a scientist, you want to choose wisely. You want to choose the paradigm that is competing um, that will ultimately win out. So practitioners or schools generate a comprehensive synthesis of facts, and construct them and they agree upon the interpretations of those facts and that helps to formulate the paradigm. So the next generation accepts the new paradigm and the old generation that doesn't retires. So a paradigm um, forms subgroups, specializations, disciplines, they come up with names for themselves, associations are formed often within a conference of a discipline, um, sometimes an entirely new discipline may form, um, but you'll begin to see specializations like new journals that appear and how long those journals last, people must subscribe to them, um, is a determination of the strength of that paradigm. So professional societies um, like environmental archaeology, this journal Feminist Encounters, uh, and Symbolic Interaction, these are um, formed around paradigms and they claim their space in the academy. Um, conference sessions will be formed, groups of adherents will latch on and begin to ask questions that are framed around that group's activities. It's a, it's a community. So paradigm then um, promises success at resolving all of the anomalies that are out there. Any doubt that there is about an explanation or a natural occurrence will be resolved by the new paradigm. Normal science is the actualization of that promise. It's the implementation of resolving those promises that are made by the new paradigm. So normal science in a phase of normal science, which is the majority of the time, long stretches of what we would consider normal science, this is actually just the mopping up phase after a new paradigm emerges. It's the cleaning up, tidying things up, cleaning up the mess that's caused by a revolution in science. So mopping up is what engages most scientists throughout their entire careers. It's far more stable um, in terms of the process. So paradigms, normal sciences, rules are derived from the paradigm. So these may not be easily determined at first. It may be difficult to recognize what the rules are and scientists may disagree. In fact, scientists often disagree. It's part of science. The existence of a paradigm 
does not ensure that there are standard rules yet. If the mopping up phase will determine what those standardized rules are for the new paradigm. The questions that are encountered by students from high school students, freshmen in college, through the PhD or doctorate student, these are closely modeled by the previous paradigm, even if you're in the midst of a paradigm shift. So anomalies are keys to scientific discovery and learning. When normal science is successful, it actually discovers anomalies. And remember, anomalies are the things that normal science tries to suppress, while at the same time, it's looking for new anomalies. So you see the contradiction there. Discovery occurs when there is an awareness of an anomaly. Often scientists aren't even aware that an anomaly exists, but when they uncover it, they discover that anomaly and they put it out there, um, it, needs, it begs for an explanation. This is the pr very beginning process of what may become a new paradigm shift. There's a recognition that the rules of the old paradigm are being violated by a collection of anomalies. So a paradigm change begins with the expectation of anomalies. In archeology, span the science that I practice, anomalies are very exciting. They're things that cannot be explained um, and they generate a lot of excitement. Why is normal science so successful and effective at uncovering new anomalies, especially when it tries to suppress them at first? This seems to be a contradiction, which is inherent in science and its process. The more comprehensive and far-reaching a paradigm is, the more successful it will be at discovering anomalies, even though those anomalies have the potential to destroy the paradigm itself. So anomalies penetrate existing knowledge to its core and it shakes assumptions. It changes knowledge. So they're very important. As anomalies collect and increase, if they cannot be explained, they form a crisis. A crisis is the failure to explain anomalies by the paradigm, and there's a search for new explanations, new methodologies, new questions to help resolve these anomalies. Anomalies are facts that cannot be explained by the paradigm. So failure of existing rules is the prelude to the invention of new rules. Failures are recognized for a long time. Scientists are smart people. They recognize anomalies that are being suppressed and anomalies that can't be explained. This bothers them. Try to resolve that crisis. The crisis is seldom a big surprise. They know what's coming. So crises is a failure which is brought about by observe discrepancies between fact and theory. Changes in social climates can lead to a crisis in science. We'll, we'll talk about the, these types of situations in subsequent videos. It happens quite often in anthropology where the social climate influences scientific inquiry. It's a very important part of the process. There's criticism of existing theories. When you hear a scientist Scientists often criticize theories. It's part of their nature. It's part of the learning process. A crisis reveals that there is tension in the discipline. Essential tension is implicit in the research process. There has to be this tug or debate between opposing camps or explanations. Every research question is a potential crisis in the making. Some are unable to live with the crisis, and so they quit or they retire, usually towards the end of their careers. They can't handle it anymore. It's you know, mind-blowing. So failure to resolve a crisis impacts the scientist personally, not necessarily the theory. You know, science is all about being impersonal. It's all about not the person or the scientist. It's about the work. But failure to resolve 
crises. It hurts. It, they, scientists will take it personally. It penetrates to the core. So in a crisis, scientists express discontent. They have a hard time grappling with the changes that are before him. They prefer to operate in a normal science mode, even though all their work is designed to be potentially revolutionary. The majority of the work is not revolutionary. Remember, the majority of the work is mopping up or normal science. So they generate speculative theories, or hypotheses, many of which will fail. Um, a crisis often proliferates a whole range of new discoveries. So it is an exciting time. All crises close in th one of three different ways. Normal science is able to handle the crisis. It can cover up or explain the anomalies, and it returns back to normal science. This happens frequently. Or crises persist. They're not explained, and the field begins to blame itself. It senses it's in a crisis. It has self-doubt, right? It has... Um, uh, in, act, in um, adequacies that it cannot cope with. So an inability to cope, but it continues. So the discipline itself may go into a form of imposter syndrome or doubts itself. A new paradigm candidate may emerge and then a battle ensues between the old paradigm and the new one. It's a competition of, of knowledge. This is a revolution. So developmental episode in which an older paradigm is replaced in whole or in part by an incompatible new one. Two explanations are not compatible. They're not going to get along. One will overcome the other. It's a revolution. Paradigm differences cannot be reconciled together. It's analogous to a political revolution where you have two opposing parties or sides. Um, sometimes that ends in an actual conflict or a war. Sometimes it's resolved peacefully, but one party or worldview is replaced by the other. When normal science fails, two or more competing parties or camps vie for adherence. They attempt to attract students. Often it's the students that decide which um, explanation or paradigm is most suitable. So in the case of a scientific revolution, one competing explanation replaces the previous one. New paradigms are destructive. It's a destructive process, but it's necessary for renewal of the discipline. So a revolution is a big debate. During a revolution, Theories will talk past each other about the same facts. Circular arguments will form. They emerge as each theory serves to satisfy the criteria it dictates for itself and falls short of those dictated by its opponent. So they will speak past each other about the same phenomenon. They're not really interested in accepting uh, the opponent's point of view in a debate like this. When a paradigm changes, the world itself changes with it, or our worldview will shift. After a revolution, science responds with new research and new methods and new questions, and scientists begin to see new things in old data. They see the facts in a different way. So in a, revol in a process of resolution, of the, the ending of the revolutionary period, Proponents of the new paradigm devote their lives and their entire careers to it. So in graduate school, particularly in the PhD phase, choose wisely. Want to choose the paradigm that will lead the future and not fade away. You want your work to be relevant. Lifelong resistance to alternatives is not a violation of science. Instead, it's an index of scientific research itself. It's an index of the health of the discipline and of the inquiry. So transferring from one paradigm to another paradigm is very difficult for scientists. Something about the way our personalities and our implicit biases frame the nature of how our brains work 
makes it very difficult to switch paradigms. Not impossible though, people have done it in the past and we will review some of those revolutionary thinkers that have done such a thing. In the process of revolution, conversion to the new paradigm is possible and it is necessary. Individuals accept the new paradigm for a variety of personal reasons, their background, um, and they move forward with uh, normal science. New research paradigm structures the questions to be asked and guides the rules for the new research agendas. During resolution, the new paradigm is accepted when it resolves all or most of all of those pesky anomalies and it incorporates most of the known facts, so it cleans up any loose ends, and then the process begins again. Quick note to credit some of the images that we've used in this video. Um, we'll talk more about this in subsequent videos and specific examples from anthropology, and I thank you all for your time. Happy sciencing.